continue to pray for Pastor Harold. Uh, we love him very much. We love him dearly. We, we miss him, and he knows that, and he knows that we love him. And we all know that he loves us uh, tremendously. So uh, we're continuing our prayer for Brother, for brother Tony. We know that uh, Brother Tony's in God's hands and always has been and always will be. And uh, we know when we get to see Brother Tony, when he feels well enough to be here, that he, he's always an encouragement, isn't he? He's, he's always lifted up, and, and he's always trying to talk about what's, uh, you know, how's it going with us. He doesn't usually want to talk about himself that much, but, you know, and that's, that's the way Brother Tony is. He's just a man that has a lot of love for us, and we miss him. So this morning, we're going to begin our message in John chapter 10. Please turn with me to John chapter 10. I apologize if I have um, missed any announcements. We do have a couple birthdays that we could sing uh, next week. We're going to wait for next week. So... I wanted to talk about his sheep, Jesus' sheep. The Lord led me in a couple different directions and wanted to talk about this one because it, it's, it's yet another time we get to see in the word of God where we have a great comfort being God's people. We understand who our Lord Jesus Christ is. We understand who he is and who he came to be. He came to be the Savior. And that's always been the plan of God through eternity and he's always been the one who would be the Messiah and in verse 9 or I'm sorry in chapter 9 we need some background before Jesus starts talking about him and being the shepherd but let's first start in chapter 10 let's look at verse 1 chapter 10 verse 1 of John John chapter 10 verse 1 Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him that portereth openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now this morning's lesson, we're going to be in chapter 9 a little, and we're going to be in chapter 10 a little, and we're going to see some main thoughts that are present in both chapters. But, but right now, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Father. Thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. Thank you for the forgiveness of the sins for your elect. We thank you, Lord, that we are in a land of worship, Father, that where we can come together and worship you and the freedom. We thank you, Father, for blessing our nation. We ask your blessings upon it today. and We ask your blessings upon our president. Father, we pray, Lord, that we know that all things are in your hands and in your control. All things are in your time. Father, we, we know that uh, we are to serve you and worship you and thank you every day of our lives till you take us home. Father, we pray for those who cannot be here, if they're not feeling well or if they're sick. We pray that you'll be with each one there and each need, each heart, each mind. We thank you, Father, for your kind of church and all your churches this morning, Father, who are meeting or who may father be having to go through facebook live or another means uh, to give the word father we do pray for your churches and we know lord that you will preserve all of your saints in jesus name i pray amen so in chapter nine from background jesus just healed a blind man and if you go way back and uh, i'll go and I know that there's probably a lot here carved out for me to do, so I won't go as, as fast as I want to go, but we need to kind of skip around and, and see a narrative in chapter 9. In chapter 9, verse 1, he says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And so in verse 6, 
that, well, through verse 6, Jesus says in verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. In verse 6, he says, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with that clay, and said unto him, go wash in the pool of Salalim, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seen. And so far, we see that Jesus did the miracle of uh, healing the blind man. In verse 9, it says, Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. And what that means is in verse 8, the neighbors, uh, I probably should have just read verse 8, the neighbors, therefore, uh, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? In verse 9, some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. But he said, I am he. The man, the blind man said, hey, it's me. Y'all talking about me, it's me. And so in verse 10, he says, or therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes opened? A very simple question. In verse 11, he answered and said, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Salalim and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. So a very easy question and answer exchange there. We see this remarkable miracle that's performed by Christ it's of compassion. Uh, there, so far we can see that there's no denying that this is the same man, and then there's no denying that a miracle was performed. In verse 13, however, they bring him to the Pharisees, they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the, I don't think that was on accident either. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind <laughs> and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents, because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. So we're going to continue on in chapter 9 here and there as we highlight but the question is is why do people reject Jesus why do people with their heart reject a savior because they with their heart do not see they need a savior does that make sense and so this miracle which they cannot Explain, other than that this is the Christ, the Son of the living God. They have to figure out what trickery was there involved. What amazing plotted scheme is here that, you know, he is, he is faking. How is this, this so intricate plan that Jesus is faking? Not only were they in unbelief that Jesus did this miracle, but they go on, I mean, they don't ignore it. They go on to blame, accuse Jesus of healing on the Sabbath day, of breaking a law. So not only do they reject this miracle, which they obviously saw before him, and this isn't the first one they've seen, but they reject Jesus as Messiah, and to the point where they don't just ignore him, they accuse him of breaking the law. 
So they come to the, the blind person, and the blind person says, I've already told you what happened. Whatever Jesus is, all I know is that once I was blind, now I see. Whatever judgment you have of Jesus, I know what happened to me. And I've already told you what happened. Jesus comes to the man later. Look in verse 35. So the Pharisees cast out the blind man. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh of thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and, they, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. In verse 39, Jesus had said, he for judgment had come into the world that those who were blind might see and those who saw may be blind the Pharisees answered and said are we of those who are blind too the scriptures make it very clear here if you are not of Christ you are of the world just as the Pharisees who had a form of religion and a zeal towards God but not according to knowledge they stumbled at the stumbling block of repentance and faith. So why do people reject Jesus Christ? And the first reason is pride. Might be the, one of the only reasons, and everything else roots out and branches out from pride. Because in order to believe that Jesus is a Savior, you have to believe that you need one. I'll say that again. In order to believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is your Savior, you have to, with all your heart, believe that you need one. And when you do that, that's a surrender of pride. You must see all the worth in Jesus Christ and no worth in yourself to please God in of yourself. And there was the disconnect. There was where we see the unbelief. You know, the Pharisees saw changes all around them. And the lost people will see changes by Christ's miracle all around them. But they don't understand the hope and the songs that the saints have in their hearts on the cloudiest days, on the stormiest days. They may intellectually know who Jesus is, but they do not know Jesus from the heart. I mean, the Pharisees knew who Jesus was, and even as we see in Acts, they know who Jesus was. They, they refused to call him the Christ, if you remember. They said, why are you preaching in that man's name? Why are you doing things, and are you wanting to put that man's blood upon us? They won't even say his name. But, you know, so they intellectually know it's Jesus the Christ, but we must believe with our hearts. Some people are deceived thinking that they're a good person. And that's why they reject Christ. But what's at the heart of that? Pride. It's self-worth. The Jews thought that simply because they were God's chosen people, we know that, descendants of Abraham, uh, they were the nation and the stock of Israel, and God had historically been present with Israel and committed the oracles to Israel, the law and the, you know, the ceremonial law and his presence and protection and uh, his covenantal promises and, you know, uh, physical promises. But we saw where man disobeyed, but the Jews felt like that was in of itself favor with God. So even that was a pride. It was a pride of race. It was a pride of nation. So even they're still looking at self-value. 
So people reject Christ because they look at self-value. So the question is, are you blind this morning? Or do you see? Is you, the question that you have the same as this blind man in verse 35 in verse 36 he says he answered and said who is he Lord that I might believe on him Jesus asked this blind man dost thou believe on the son of God that is a profound sentence amongst profound Bible <laughs> you know dost thou believe on the Son of God. That was Jesus' only question. And he said, Who is he that I may know him? In verse 37, Jesus answered unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. So for a few short minutes, I want to talk about who is he that I may believe. It is God who is dealing with our hearts. It is God who is the answer to the question. So you can see how this flows into chapter 10. Okay, so in verse 41, he says, Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, you should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. They were blind because they did not see that Jesus Christ was the Messiah and the only hope of glory. And in his work was the perfect righteousness imputed. Who is he? Why he came? Who are God's sheep? And what will happen? Who is he? In verse 1 through 6, Jesus says that he is the shepherd. All else claiming, and what we read, all else claiming salvation are thieves and robbers. That Jesus is the only Savior. He's the only way unto the Father. In Acts 4.12, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus says that he is the shepherd. In verse 3, To him that the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. So we see that Jesus is the shepherd. But also in verse 7, Jesus says that he's the door. And, and well, in this parable, in verse 6, he spoke another parable in relation to it. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, I verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Not just the shepherd, but the door. All that ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. There's an exclusivity. It's simplicity. It is a very simple faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ in him alone. There's no other way of salvation. I, I don't know. I, you know, I am beyond thankful, and I know you all are too, that salvation is not a very complex religion. You know, where you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to decide to do these things. And if you look at all the other world religions, how they all based it on some kind of intrinsic value, internal worth, how am I worthy before God? That's the basis of all other religions. What can I do to please God? What is the basis? What can I choose to do? Now, you know, I'm glad it's simple. I'm glad it's simple faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know if you all are like me, but sometimes I have a hard time making a decision when I'm faced with two or three options. You know, I, I want to, I'll sit there and I'll stare. You know, I, I don't know. And it's the simplest of things. It doesn't even have to be 
you know, a major thing. I, mean, I just want to make sure I get the best value for the, my money, and so I'm going to stand there and stare at it, and sometimes it's, it, it is silly. So I'm glad that it's not left up to me, because, you know, I, I, it's only faith in Jesus Christ. That's very simple, and the Bible makes it very plain that in him and only him is salvation. And so he asked the blind man, do you believe in the Son of God? Do you believe? And he says, who is he? It's me. It's him. That's it. And then he followed Jesus worshiping and rejoicing. And what a blessing it is that God gives us his Holy Spirit. And we start learning. We start studying about salvation and how the wonder of God and his wisdom and bringing salvation and justification and the hope that he's, you know, every, all of those other doctrines, eternal security, uh, they come and how sweet they are when we study the, the word of God. And uh, I believe even more than any other time, we need to commit to the word of God and commit to it as if we weren't going to have it tomorrow. Just read it like you're not going to have it tomorrow. You know, and so uh, I believe that we should put the words of God in our hearts and that's what it actually says that's a lamp into our feet a light into our path Jesus says he's the door there's only one door and that to heaven and that is through Jesus Christ the only way to be saved and we know is through Jesus Christ we all have different decisions in our lives we all have different doors but there's only one door to heaven <laughs> and that's Jesus Christ he grants his sheep security. He grants his sheep pasture. He grants his sheep love for him. Isn't that something? Not only are we saved, but he is our shepherd. And, he, and he's, he's our security. He feeds us in the pasture. There's nothing he wouldn't give us. There's nothing in this life that he will allow to you know, bring us to a point of despair to where we feel like we're hopeless and helpless and have, you know, he's forsaken us or anything of that nature. And also, he brings a love that we have to him because he proves us over and over and over that we see his faithfulness every day. We see his faithfulness every day and we have hope in his faithfulness that he shall stand on that last day and he will redeem all his people. And we all will be together with him in heaven. Why did the shepherd do this for his sheep? In verses 10 through 18, he says, The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, See if the wolf cometh and leaveth the sheep and fleeth and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. You know, just by the negative of that, isn't it good to know that he cares for us? Just another place. Because he's given the opposite of somebody else. Those other people don't care about the sheep, but Jesus cares <laughs> about the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Oh, that's a love. That's a love. That's a gnosko. We've talked about gnosko. We've talked about the, his foreknowledge, his love, which he has given unto us, his unconditional love, that, he, that we love him because he first loved us. And that's how we know him. And we will not hear another. And so he is our shepherd, and we are his sheep. In verse 15, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. <laughs> and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. I'm so glad God called me by his grace. It wasn't anything good in me. I was a sheep that have gone astray. And God had laid upon my shepherd, the bishop of my souls, the iniquity of me upon my shepherd. He laid down his life for me. And he loves me. And I hear his voice. And I know him. 
in verse 16, and this is because of the work of Christ. He says in verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. His Father, Jesus, is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's the God of creation. He is the God of eternity. He's the God of infinity. He's the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. And he is pleased at the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for my sins. Oh, what a comfort. What a victory that gives us. What a hope we have to know that I am his sheep. You know, that some people think being called a sheep is a bad thing. But when, not when you're Christ's sheep. Not when you're the good shepherd's sheep. I'll be his sheep because he has saved me. I could not save myself. I was dumb. I was bleeding, you know, here and there, getting my face stuck in bob wire and everything else. But he grabbed me and, and took me unto himself. Why Jesus is the door? Because salvation is given by God. It's not earned by man. Salvation is given by God and not earned by man. That's why people reject because of the pride. Jesus voluntarily laid down his life. When Pilate asked Jesus, why don't you answer me? Don't you know that I have the power to release you? Jesus replied to him, you have no power at all over me unless my Father has given it to you. Jesus went willingly because it was the only way that he could be the door. Jesus went willingly to the cross because it was the only way that he could be the door. The blind man asked Jesus, Who is it, Lord, that I may believe? And Jesus says, It is he who speaks. It is I who speak with you. And that is the place where we must come in our hearts. You know, does, is he speaking to you? Is, is Christ speaking to you? And it's a heart issue. It's a heart matter. Who is he? And I have a lot of notes here that I'm, I'm going to skip. But we know that Jesus, it was him that cried out upon the cross, laying down his life for my sins, my Redeemer. They nailed him to the old rugged cross. They drove nails deeper and deeper, sending chills and anguish through his nerve endings. Those of you uh, who have had nerve issues know how painful. I mean, how much pain Christ was in is unthinkable, unbearable. And I can't even fathom to think how much pain he was in. Physical pain, not just the emotional and torment of those three dark hours before God, where God had to hide his face when God was imputing my sin upon his dear son. Oh, the love. The love that saved me. The love of my shepherd. It was him who cried, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost. It is him who rose up the third day from the grave. All victory was given to him. God is satisfied by the sacrifice. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. He's the first fruit of the resurrection. And all glory and honor and power is his. There is nothing more for Christ to do. Salvation is a gift of God. It's not something we earn. It's a gift of God. It's through repentance and faith. He gave his life for his sheep and his sheep. Hear his voice when he says unto them, Come unto me, whosoever believeth on him. If you hear his voice today and you believe upon him, thou shalt have everlasting life and not perish. Because we are his sheep. He calls his sheep. He knows his sheep. And if he's calling you, that you respond in faith, repentance and faith and belief, that if you hear Christ calling you, hear him in your heart, hey, you know what? Not everybody hears that call. Because not everybody his sheep. That's a, 
a deeper lesson that we find out here. Hopefully we'll get to it. In verse 32. Well, hold on just a second. Let me find this. No, I'm sorry. Uh, verse 25. So we read 18. And there was a division among the Jews in verse 19. And then verse 22, it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication. In verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And then what did the Jews do? They took up stones to stone him. We see that he preserves eternal life in his sheep. No man takes it from him. No man, once we are in his hands, we are not... We can never be plucked out of Jesus Christ's hands. That's the plain teaching of the word of God, not just here and many other places. The good shepherd provides for us. The question that you must ask yourself is, are you of his sheepfold? Are you of his sheep? Jesus plainly, and there, there's the, there was the question. They said, are we blind? The Pharisees wanted to know, are we blind? Because Jesus said he came that the blind might see. But those who see, may be blinded. The Pharisees thought they were okay. The Pharisees didn't see a need for repentance. They didn't see a need to ask for forgiveness. Uh, many people today, that is why they reject Jesus as their Savior, because they don't believe they need one. Because they're not sorry for what they've done. And so Jesus says here, you are not my sheep. He told the Pharisees, you are not my sheep because you heard not my voice and you are not known of me. And, and is that what he said there at the end of time? He says, Master, Master, have we not done all these things? Have we not done all these wonderful things? And Jesus will say, depart from me for I never knew you. I never knew you. But isn't it wonderful? Isn't it glorious that God saves us by his grace? That it is not works, for we are saved by grace through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Today is the day of the invitation. We give out a general invitation of salvation that Jesus is right here. Come unto him. Whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be cast out. And when we hear his voice and we believe with all our heart and repent and believe that Jesus is our Savior and that he died there on the cross paying for your sins as your sin substitute, but he rose again the third day victorious with the power of himself. In Romans 1, it said the resurrection with the power that he rose declared him to be the Son of God. He was born after the seed of David, but declared to be the Son of God with the resurrection. He himself rose, just like he said he would, rose himself up. He had the power to lay it down and the power to raise it up again. And he has the power to come back one day and come get his sheep. And we will be physically with him. We'll see our Savior face to face. And what a day that'll be. My prayer, my hope is that you're saved today. That you just take a time and just meditate and examine your heart is Christ calling you today. And we thank you for being with us here this morning. Again at 2 o'clock we will be having a message. We're going to continue in Romans. 
uh, this afternoon, Romans chapter 4, what a beautiful study it is. We hope that you'll come back at 2 o'clock. For us here, let's all stand and brother. I shine in.